Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. The kingdom responds to change and crisis, part four. Am I correct? This is session four. Understanding kingdom keys to thriving in times of crisis. I want to pick up where we left off in our last session as we talked about the key to overcoming crisis. I want to begin this session with a reality check again. And the reality check is this. Kingdom citizens are not immune to crisis. Don't live under the false notion that because you are in the kingdom of God, you won't experience difficulties. You will experience some experience in them. Matter of fact, Jesus guarantees it. He promises it that you will have many troubles, crises, tragedies. The difference is your response to them will be not like the world's response. I want to read, for example, from the words of Jesus Christ himself where he guarantees that crisis will affect everybody, even the kingdom citizen. Because the storm will hit everybody. Survival in a crisis, therefore, will depend on your foundation knowledge. Everybody will feel the wind. Everybody will feel the waves. Everybody will feel the rain. and Everybody will be impacted by the economic conditions. You will feel the impact of unemployment and banks collapsing. You have to live in this system, the cosmos, the world. But your survival through the process will be dependent upon your foundation knowledge. Everybody say foundation knowledge. Foundation. Say foundation loud. Foundation. In other words, the key to your succeeding in crisis is knowledge that can help you manage the crisis. One of the most important keys in the kingdom of God is management. This is not taught in the Christian church too much, if ever. In our ministry, this is one of our major principles that we teach, management. Management is probably the, the most important component in kingdom living because it is the reason why God created you. I'm going to say something that will cause a problem for you as I normally do. Here it is. Management is more important than worship. And there we go. All the religious people will attack me now. Religious people are amazing people. Management is more important than worship because in the kingdom of God, management is worship. Management is the key to prosperity in the midst of poverty. Management. Everybody say management. God is more concerned about your management than he is about your prayer. And that's why you're struggling with your life right now. You are a poor manager. Management is not a religious activity. It's a kingdom activity. Yeah. Write this down. Management is the key to promotion in the midst of crisis. 
you as a kingdom citizen are supposed to actually be promoted when everybody else is being fired. Yeah. And the key to that is management. God will always reward management. He will always trust effective management. Management protects you from losing God's favor. The average person in this auditorium don't know what I'm talking about right now. Because the word management to you is not a religious word. And you're right. It's a biblical word, not a religious word. It is the motivation for creation of mankind. Management is the key to power in crisis. What is? Management. I know you're still shocked. What is he talking about? Well, the reason why God created you was not because he needed a worshiper. God created you because he needed a manager. And we have missed it. We give God things he never asked for. And ignore things God demand. Uh, let me give you a little homework. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Let's find out why God created you. This is very important. Genesis chapter 2. Everybody has it? Okay. Verse 1 says, Genesis chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all of their vast array. Okay, fine. Verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Now watch this. In other words, chapter 2 is reviewing and explaining chapter 1. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. In other words, when God made the earth, he allowed nothing to grow. Can I prove it? Read the next verse, the next statement. For the Lord had not yet sent what? Rain on the earth. So there was no life on the earth when God first created the earth. Why? According to this verse, nothing had appeared. No plants, no life. It didn't say they didn't exist. Read it. It says they didn't what? Appear. Why? They were trapped underground. How do we know that? Read the next statement. For the Lord had not sent rain. In other words, God refused to let anything grow. He allowed nothing to progress, nothing to expand. He allowed no life to progress. He actually stopped it from growing. He refused to send the rain. Everybody see that there? Are you sure? Now, the question is why? Let's read the next statement. You never saw this before, so read it. He didn't allow any streams. Why? For there was no man. Now you never saw that before. He allowed nothing to grow because he was lacking something. There was no man to what? Work the ground. Write the word work down please. This is your homework. The word work here is the Hebrew word which means to manage. To manage, to order, to develop, to cultivate. 
this verse explains why God had to create you. He didn't allow anything to grow because there was no what? Man to manage the earth. So he didn't allow the streams to spring up. No water over the whole surface. Why? Look at verse 7. Then the Lord does what? He formed the man. So what made God form the man? There was no man to manage. This is in your Bible. So why did God create you? What was the motivation for creation? It was in worship. He didn't have a manager. That's your job. You look like you're in shock. It's amazing how we don't read the Bible. We read our hymn books. Now, let me give you some lessons to learn from this one, because I ain't got time to go through details. <laughs> Write this down, number one. God will never allow growth where there is no manager. Number two. God will not allow progress where there is no manager. Look at what it says. He refused even to let plants grow. <laughs> Number three, God will withhold rain where there is no manager. You know, we keep singing, rain on me, rain on me, Lord. And God is saying, are you crazy? You can't even manage your weight. Oh boy, I'm getting in trouble now. You can't manage your time. You can't manage 10% of your money. <laughs> Number four. God will only give you what you can manage. Amen. Write it down. What did I say? <laughs> Don't forget that. He refuses rain where there's no management. Number five. God will not give you what you pray for. He will only give you what you can manage. Amen. Write it down. Amen. That's why your prayer is being ignored. Number six, never pray beyond your ability to manage. What did I say? Some of you are asking God for a million dollars and you can't tithe on a hundred. You asking God for a house and you're not keeping the people's apartment clean. Oh, I want to talk to you. Can I come out here and talk to you a little bit? You asking God for a car and your motorbike is dirty. Number seven, whatever you mismanage, you lose. What did I say? Yes. Whatever you mismanage, you will lose. That's a principle of the kingdom of God. You mismanage your marriage, you'll lose your marriage. You mismanage your body, it'll kill you. You mismanage your time, it'll fly away. You mismanage your money, you'll always be broke. It's no secret to why you are what you are. You are a bad manager. 
You spend five hours watching TV and two minutes reading the Bible. No wonder why you are full of the world stuff and don't know kingdom stuff. It's just bad management. There was no man to manage. So God created the man from the dust of the ground and he blew into him the breath of life. That's the next verse, verse 7. And man became a living soul. God now has a manager. That's why he says, dominate. Manage this place for me. You know why people are so useless to God? Because they want to leave the place God gave them to manage. They want to go to heaven. You're useless. You are so heavenly minded, you are corrupting God's plan. I asked God a question. By the way, I have a book coming out. I'm talking about this in detail. But I asked God a question years ago. I said, God, how come these charismatic people are always quoting? The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I said, God, why? Why do we quote that? He said, go and read it. I went and read it. And the verse doesn't end there. It says, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous, and a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You ain't leaving nothing to your grandchildren right now. And you're born again. You just barely living off your retirement. You are useless. You, you, you failed God. Your grandkids have nothing from you that will last. They don't want your clothing. That's not inheritance. And here you are singing, worshiping, and you disobey God. You're not leaving an inheritance to your children's children. And I said, God, what's wrong? He said, read it again. And I read it again. It says, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. And a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And I never saw it before until that day. God said, see? First of all, he says, who did I tell you have the wealth? I said, the wicked. He says, good. He says, how do you know that I know they have it? I said, I don't know. I was ashamed. He says, I gave it to them. He said, have you ever wondered why I gave it to them? Because I only give resources to those who can manage. Management is so serious to God that he'd rather give it to the wicked to protect it from you holy mismanagers. And do you know what we do? We lazy people, we try to claim it out of their hands. That's why we're broke. I claim. Claim what? You've been claiming for the last five years and you still broke. And the wicked still get it. Why? Because you don't get it by claiming. You get it by attracting it through management. You know what God says? Jesus did a seminar on management. It's found in Luke chapter 16. Write that down. Luke 16. Read that when you go home. It's a seminar on management. Jesus said, look, there was a man who had a manager. This is how he starts the story. And his boss had given him management over his whole resources, his company. And the, mis the manager mismanaged the, 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 the goods. He's telling a story about creation. He says, look. And when the man came back and he says, Shh, give an account of your management, he realized that the man had mismanaged. And the scripture says, and he said to him, you will be manager no longer. In other words, God fires people. Luke. Chapter 16, read it yourself. Then he says, this manager 
realized he was about to lose his job and so he went out and he began to organize management again to get the creditors to pay the company of his boss. He began to get money back that the company had out. And when he did that, the man came back and says, you are a wise manager. The word there is shrewd, skillful. You've gotten back into management. Therefore, I commend you. Next verse, Jesus said, therefore, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Words of Jesus. Can I read the next verse? Therefore, go and make friends with the world. Now, you've been taught the opposite by your church. You've been taught, stay away from them. Christ says, go and make friends with them. Why? They know how to manage. Go and learn how they manage. They are more successful in using my principles than you are. And that's why you are hired by them. You work for wicked people. You claim your God is good and you're hired by the wicked. You are confused. And there we are. And then he made these statements. Go and make friends with them so that in this world you will gain wealth and also in the next world. Next verse. For he who is faithful over little, I will make him ruler over much. He said, don't pray for much. Just manage the little well first. God will never give you a million dollars. Never. He'll give you ten dollars. And then he'll say, give me one. And you can't give him one. He goes on to say this in the same chapter. He says, he who is unfaithful in little will be unfaithful in much. If you can't manage a hundred bucks, don't you dare pray for a hundred thousand dollars. Amen. Amen. All this confession stuff we're talking about don't make no sense to God. I claim this. You claim what? You can't even manage your own bedroom. It's a mess. You're asking God for your own company and you can't even go to people's job on time. It's bad management. Can I quote another verse from Luke 16? He says, if you are not able to manage other people's wealth, who will give you wealth of your own? Words of Jesus. That's why God will never give you a business first. He'll always give you a job first. Because he wants to watch how you manage other people's property. before he trusts you with property of your own. Never trust people who cannot keep jobs. Ah. Always changing jobs every other month. They are untrustworthy. Be careful with those people. Don't give them resources. And most of these people hang around churches. Every disciple that Jesus chose was working. Write that down, please. Peter, James, and John owned their own fishing company. He didn't choose lazy people. He chose managers. Mm -hmm. And this is why this crisis we're going through now in the world, companies are rejoicing. Because now they can get rid of dead weight. 
They are glad to release people who have been parasites on the company. It's a cleanse, remember? Hurricanes come to cleanse. In some cases, you didn't lose a job. God protected the company. You're always late. Take two hours for lunch. Lie about being sick. And leave early in the afternoon. You are a parasite. A speaking in tongues parasite too. Bad management. So you lost your job. Whatever you mismanage, you lose. Have mercy. Here you are as a pastor praying for God to, you know, you want to win the city. God says, are you crazy? You prayed that prayer for the Lord to give you the city. If 300,000 people showed up Sunday morning, lined up in your church parking lot, can you manage that? So God ignores your prayer. If you cannot be faithful over a little, who will make you ruler over much? Words of Jesus. Okay, let's talk about this crisis hitting everybody. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus told a story about managing your life, building it on the right foundation to handle crisis. Let's read it. Verse 24, Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Not just a rock, the rock. It's God. Now notice the guy who believes in God, obeys his word, and builds his life on the rock. The next verse says, the rain still came. <laughs> Being born again will protect you from rain. The rain came, and what? The streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house. I'm talking about a kingdom house. Why? You're supposed to be built for rain. Built for storm. Built for wind. We're not lazy people. We're not jellyback people. We don't just pray for God to bless us. We pray for God to make us powerful. To handle crisis. Stop blaming everything on the devil. <laughs> Look at the next statement. It says, Yet it did not fall. Tell your neighbor, be standing when the crisis is over. Amen. And then I'll believe that you are a kingdom citizen. Yeah. You know, we love to dance and praise the Lord until trouble comes. Then we backslide. The house stood and did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock. Remember, I told you at the beginning of this session that the survival of your life is the knowledge of your foundation. Crisis cannot destroy the foundation if it's a rock. So your decisions today has to be, where am I grounded? He goes on to talk about another house. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The winds blew, the rain came, streams rose, and beat against that house also, and that one fell with a great crash. 
there are going to be a lot of crashes around you the next few months. It's already begun. And many of them are going to be in your church. Because who you think are grounded are not. They're going to give up. They're going to, they're going to collapse under the weight of the crisis. They're going to actually turn back, some of them. Forget God. They're going to sacrifice their pride and, and sacrifice their standards and sacrifice their convictions to make a living. And that's why God sent you here. So you can get this message that you are built for crisis. Selah. Now, let's talk a little bit about how you're supposed to respond to it. What is this foundation that is so strong? Uh, I call it crisis and creativity. Write this down. Crisis is the cradle of creativity. In other words, when crisis comes, God's people become creative, not intimidated. Another point. Crisis and pressure are the incubators of innovation. And that's what I want to leave with you today in this session. Innovative thinking. Innovation is the most positive product of crisis. That's why God sends them or why God allows crisis. He does it to create innovative thinking because you have a lazy mind. You don't grow in good times. The saddest thing for a believer is a comfortable life. And this is why what you call a crisis to God is a tool for progress. And in the world right now, everything's falling apart to make everybody grow. Don't curse the crisis. Thank it for stretching you, for upsetting you, because you have become lethargic. Put it another way. Innovation. This is good stuff here. You got to write this down. Innovation. Number one, there is nothing new on planet Earth. Very important. Say it with me. There's nothing new on planet Earth. So what is innovation? We call innovation new stuff. There's no, no such thing as a new thing on Earth. Well, number two is very important. New is our definition of innovation. When someone innovates a product, we call it new. But the Bible says there's nothing new on earth. So number three is key. Everything new is simply a combination of old things. That's why the solution to the present crisis is on earth. It's very simple. Case in point. Every time you say, I bought a new pair of shoe, that's not true. That's an old cow. <laughs> Am I right? You say you bought a new dress. Not true. That's an old sheep. You tell me you bought a new suit, sir. No, it's an old sheep. The wool. You call it new. They combined it in a different way and made a suit. It's an old sheep. You say to me you built a new house. That's old dirt, cement. You say you bought a new car. That's old iron ore and tin. Aluminum. It's old. There's nothing new around us. <laughs> and therefore, number four is powerful. Innovation is the ability to continue to combine 
old in new ways. You know, God didn't create anything after Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He simply used what was there to combine it in new ways. Hmm. Your body came from old dirt. Genesis 2 verse 7. Trees came out of the ground. They are old dirt. That's why when they die, they go back to the dirt. He didn't create trees. He simply made them. The two words used in the Genesis narrative is very important. The word create is used in verse 1. After that, the word make is used. Two different words. Hebrew word barach means to create, to form from nothing. The word make is the word asa. It means to form from something that's already present. When it came to humans, God used both words. God created man and then he made man. A part of you came from nothing. That's the spirit part. He didn't use anything in earth to produce the spirit man. He took it out of himself. But the body he made from the dirt. So your body was made, but you were created. And God took the created and put it inside what was made. So when you die, your body dies, it goes back to where it came from, it's old dirt. But you go back to the Spirit of God. Innovation is simply the recombining of old things in new ways. The solution to all of your problems are in your reach right now. The problem is the old combinations ain't working no more. That's why President Obama don't know what to do and he have to try things we never tried before because the old combinations of the capitalist economy has collapsed. So the books in Harvard University don't work no more because everything they had created is no longer working. So now they got to experiment with new combinations. And they never had the U.S. government buy a bank before. But they say if we don't try something, everything going to fall apart. We got to try something, they say. Let's combine some new things. And we hate new if it costs us. Write this down. Creativity is innovative thinking. What is innovation? Combining old things in new ways. Do you know how much money you have in your house right now? You think you're poor. You are rich. Your problem is you can't see anymore. There's wealth in your car that you're driving every day. Your closet is filled with money and you call yourself broke. You can't see anymore. Your yard is actually a farm, but you made it a garden. You can't eat roses. You can't eat tulips. And you're sitting there saying, I'm hungry. You ain't hungry. You can't see. Is anybody here? Take up your roses and plant yourself some carrots. That's what crisis does. It shakes loose old thoughts. My wife and I, my wife will tell you, man, we have in our yard now, we got so much cabbage, so much lettuce. Why? Because we are productive people. We, we are giving cabbage away free the next two weeks to members of the church why because we use our yard for productivity you look at your flowers we eat ours what's your problem you can't see the soil is there you ain't gotta buy it it's been there but you can't see That's right. 
Oh, boy. You're not poor. You're just blind. Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. You can't see. So let's talk about the paradox of innovation. Write this down. Everything God created is still here. Say that with me. Everything God created is still here. You still don't understand what you just said. Listen, they are telling us there's no money in the system. There's no money in the system. They are lying. No money left the planet. Okay. Hello, somebody. All the money on the earth is still here. Didn't go to the moon. Didn't go to Jupiter. Didn't go to Pluto. It is here. It is somewhere. All the money is on earth somewhere. It's still here. Never left the planet. Your problem is the money is hiding from you because you've been a bad manager. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the secret wealth of riches, God knows where it is. Money hides from bad managers. That's why when those CEOs messed up the mortgage company situation, the money ran away. Hasn't left. Still here. Write this down. Money is attracted to management. When you start mismanaging people's mortgage arrangements, money runs from you. Mr. Madoff mismanaged billions. He lost everything. Enron mismanaged resources. They lost everything. And you mismanage your tithe. I said you mismanage your tithe and you lost everything still. Money runs from bad management. Don't forget to tithe, son. I don't care what crisis does, you still tithe because that's God's view of your management. You were never created to live off your salary. That's why your salary can never pay your bills. God never planned that. God gave you a salary to develop management. Give me 10%, he says, every time. And you keep stealing it. So he says, you've robbed me. And because of that, the devourer is coming to eat all of your crops. I'm going to take everything from you. Number two, there is nothing new under the sun. That's good news. That means in your environment right now is the solution to your crisis. What you got to ask God for is new sight. You're not poor, you're blind. You're not unemployed, you just can't see. God never gave Adam a job. He never gave Adam a tree, I mean a, a desk. He never gave Adam a chair. He hid them in the trees. Come on, think for a minute. Never gave Adam anything. He just said, look, here, there's the garden. He said, there's some water, some gold, some trees. Go for yourself. And Adam had to think to take the chair out of the tree. That's innovation. A new chair is an old tree, remember? You go to the furniture store to buy a new, new sofa, and God is saying, that's an old tree. The innovator will always prosper, not the consumer. And God has sent me into your life to transform you from being a consumer to an innovator. Kingdom people innovate. We don't panic in crisis, we progress in crisis. Can I hear an amen? amen. Tell your neighbor, think. 
Tell them again. Think. think. Shout at them loud. Think. think. Look at them. Tell them one more time. Think. think. That's your problem. You're not thinking. Think. You got to think in new ways. Number three. Everything man made is a combination of old things. Everything. That's the paradox of innovation. Bill Gates took old ideas and recombined them. Stephen Jobs took old plastic and made laptop. I mean, what is there new? Ecclesiastes 1 says there's nothing new under the sun, which means that whatever you need is already here. So number four is very important. Everything necessary to invent the next new thing is already present. Let me ask you a question you never thought of. Do you think that Moses could have flown an airplane? Think for a minute. Absolutely yes. Why? Everything necessary to fly was there. <laughs> there was gravity, there was wood, there was rubber trees, and there was lift. The only problem is Moses couldn't combine them in the right way to produce what the Wright brothers produced. Everything was present. So everything you need to get out of your situation right now is present. Your problem is you can't see the combinations. So when you pray to God, don't ask God to solve your problems. Ask God to give you the ideas present to solve the problem. Amen. Pray for divine ideas. Pray for insight, not just sight, insight. You know, when we was building our church building, I made it very clear, this is not a religious building. So we built a, a beautiful building. It's the largest one in the Bahamas at the moment. And we built it. It's called the Diplomat Center for leaders. So now all these organizations rent our buildings. Why? Because I'm smart. We gotta, when the building is not being used by us, it should also be making money. That's right. Idea. That's right. So all the schools rent our building for graduations. The government rent our buildings for national events. And we collect the money. Why? Because if you're stuck with a building with steeples and bells and crosses, you can't rent it out. Combinations of new things. So you got a building that shut down four days a week and ain't bringing you no revenue. You are abusing God's resources, calling it a church building. There you go. Innovation. Tell your neighbor, think. Say it loud. Think. Tell them again, think. I want you to go back home and study your house. Walk through it. Walk through your apartment. Study it. See what's there that you never saw before. Combine some things and make some money in crisis. Your oven been sitting there. You use it once a week. That's stupid. Why don't you bake some cakes and sell them every day? Because you don't think. You are paying for an oven that's not producing. You are a bad manager. And you tell me you are unemployed. You're not employed, you're stupid, that's all. You need to go back home and look at your oven. This is a production center. Let me get some flowers and some cinnamon. I'm gonna bake some cookies, get myself a business out of this oven. New combination of old things. Oh, those pots in your house are a disgrace they're sitting there empty listen mama you could make soup very well go back make that soup your mama taught you and sell that thing in plastic bowls to those construction workers and make yourself some money. I'm old. Oh, shut up, you ain't old. You just think you're old. Go to work. (laughs) 
Come on, clap your hands anyhow. Praise God. Kingdom thinking. Come on, say to your neighbor, think. think. Say it loud. Think, girl. Think. One time I asked God, why did you give us a brain with 500 billion cells? His answer was simple. He says, because I want to rest sometime. Write this down. Innovation is the ability to see beyond sight. You know, the Bible says about the kingdom citizen, you walk by faith and not by sight. Faith means belief. What do you believe about your car? Is it just for mobile to work in the church or is it a business on wheels? If you're going to buy a car, you might as well buy yourself a limousine to use for business. And drive it to church when you're ready. Still got to pay the note. Oh boy. Ask God for vision. Vision is the ability to see beyond your eyes. The greatest enemy of sight, the greatest enemy of vision is sight. Because sight always shows you what is. Vision shows you what could be. Don't trust your sight. It'll keep you poor. For the just shall live by faith. For they walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, I got 30 slides. This is number four. And I'm going to soon leave you. Write this down. Everything you need to accomplish your dream is present now. It's amazing how we keep looking to other people for things. The bank didn't give me any money, so I can't start my vision. My friends wouldn't help me, so I can't start my vision. What are you talking about? Think. Study what you have. You know, I notice about God, he always asks this question. Every time someone complains, he would ask this question. What is in your hand? Famous question of Jesus, what do you have? You know, we always look for something else. What do you have, he says. Bring it to me. Moses, what do you have? Moses had something that he had all along. What do you have in your house? <sighs> Woman about to die, run out of oil. And the prophet says, what is in your house? I didn't come here to give you nothing new. I'm giving you opportunity to see things in new ways. Go back home. Your crisis is not a crisis. You got a crisis of sight. I'm going to prosper in the middle of this whole thing they're talking about. Why? Because I don't see like they see. This crisis will make more millionaires than was before the crisis you are. They're going to be them sharp young fellas who see opportunities everywhere and they're going to jump on it. And while you're complaining, they're going to be cashing. And you are a child of light. You ain't got no problems, man. You just can't see. It's already here. Amen. 
Jesus says, here's some keys. Matthew 16, 19. Read. He says what? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Look at Mark 4, verse 11. Read. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. In other words, I'm giving you some secrets that the other kingdom don't know about. Don't see like they see. Bind some things together that no one else has bound together. Loose some old ideas so heaven can loose some new ideas into your mind. That's the keys. Look at the last part. The secret of the kingdom is given to you, but not to those outside. That means you are supposed to know some things they don't know, even though you're living right next to each other. You're supposed to prosper while they're starving. And they're wondering, what's your secret? You tell them, I got a secret. I found out some things from my country. Heaven is my country. And we don't think the way you all think in your country. And that's why you're here. I am here to change your citizenship. Paul says, my citizenship is in heaven. I'm on earth, but I'm not from earth, he says. And that's why you're here. Genesis 2.9. I'm going to give you this, because we've got to get ready to wind down 15 minutes. So we're going to talk fast. Sit up straight and let the devil steal this stuff, okay? Here we go. I call it the secret to wealth. Now, this is some of the keys that Jesus was trying to tell us about that we missed. In the beginning, God told this to Adam. He's talking to Adam. He says, the Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eyes, good for food. Now the Lord is talking to Adam. He says, look, there is a river watering the garden, flown from Eden. From there, it is separated into four headwaters. The first thing God told Adam about was water. You missed it, folks. Look at me. Yippee. Look at me. You missed it. He says the first power of wealth on earth, Adam, is water. Not computers. Water. When God gives you a list, you better write the list down. Secondly, verse 12, he says the gold is good. You tell him there's gold in the garden. Fourth, he says aromatic resin. That's oil. Then fifth, he says, there's onyx and precious stone. That's diamonds and pearls and rubies. Now notice the list. The list is interesting. First of all, he says, there is fruit. Then there is water. Then there is gold. Then there is resin. Then there is onyx. Now, look at the list. God's priorities are different from ours. Let me say something to you very important. What's the first thing you need in your life right now? You need food and water. Your body is 87% water. So God says, I got four times water in the garden. If you want to go into a business right now, go into the water business. Some of you are looking at me funny. Sell your house, buy an osmosis machine, reverse osmosis, and open a water company. You can't lose. Why? God says, number one. Number two, agriculture. Have you noticed that when the gas prices hit $5, everybody scattered for food. We had a choice between gas and food. What did we choose? Food. Why? Because food is more important than number four, resin. Some of you have walked away from farming. And God has sent me to tell you, go back into farming. People need food more than they need oil. I'm in discussions right now with a couple of people investing money into farming in the Bahamas. Because that's, what, that, that's the future. The farmers are going to become the wealthiest people in the next 10 years. You watch. Because you cannot eat a computer. If you were hungry, you would sell your iPhone. Oh, come on, talk to me. 
Go back to God's list. I give you fruit for food, he says, and water for drink. You want to go into business? That's it right there. No matter who starves, the water company won't. You go in that cafeteria, you buy a bottle of water. Sometimes they put sugar in it and call it soda, but it's water. You need water. Your body is 87% water. It cannot live without water, but it could live without oil. Follow God's plan. Look at the third one, gold. Gold comes after you get water and food. When you get water and your stomach is full, now you can buy some jewelry. Now, when you can't find water and oil, what do you, I mean, water and food, what do you do? You sell your jewelry. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. This is no time to buy no necklace. It's a crisis time. Amen. It's time to sell your gold. Amen. God's smart. Amen. Look at the next one, oil. When the prices of gas went up to $5, people started carpooling, catching the bus, yes. riding the train. Why? They realized, I can't waste no money on no gasoline. I'm going to take my pride and catch myself a bus. Yes. I got to go to work to get some money to buy some one and two. Food, water. Yes. Look at the next one. Precious stone. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. If you lost your job, this ain't no time to go buy yourself a diamond. It's time to what? Sell your diamonds. We, we, we all mixed up. Your house is not poor. Check your jewelry. It's a lot of money. And you can't eat a ring. You can't chew a chain. So be smart. Get rid of it now, get some money, and become liquid. Put it in the bank and hold it. Why? You need liquid. You don't need gold. The wisdom of God. And some of you all got $50,000 diamond rings, and you ain't never worn it. That's bad management. Are you glad you came here today? Yes. There's wealth in your house. God's question, what's in your house? What's in your house? You're not poor, you just can't see. And so God is forming us, eh? And here's the verse again, I want to repeat it. Why did God create us? Genesis 2, 4. It said, because there was no man to work the ground. He wanted a manager of his resources. He wanted you to cultivate what he has. And the first thing God gave Adam was not a computer. He gave him a garden. Agriculture. You left the farm, man. People need food. People need to eat. They need cattle, meat. God made Abraham a stockholder. He had stocks, not in Wall Street. He had stocks, cattle. What do you have? Think, young woman. Don't let them force you into a career that don't make no sense. Think God's list. Work. All right, let's just finish this up. The principal assignment of man, therefore, is dominion, and that dominion comes through management. 
And management is the extension of God's culture on earth. God manages heaven. And so the strategy of God is to dominate earth through work earth through management. God wants to dominate earth through what? Management. He calls it work. As a matter of fact, the first thing God gave Adam was work. So the principal reason for your creation is management. And management is the measure of your success on earth. What you don't manage, God takes from you. I'm going to give you all one of the deepest revelations you ever had in your life. Are you ready? Here it is. If you don't manage your country, foreigners will take over your country. That's a divine strategy. Who's really working in America, in the farms? Foreigners. They're taking over your country. That's why you need two languages in your schools now. You wonder what's going on. God is actually taking the country from you. God told Israel, Israel, he says, look, you're going into this land, he says. Don't forget me when you go into the land. Watch God now. He says, when you begin to prosper, don't forget me. He says, if you forget me, I will bring in the foreigner, and they shall drive you from your own land. And if you study the Bible, every time they worship idols, they lost the land. Whatever you mismanage, you lose even your country. Your laws begin to put God out of school, out of business, out of government. And God, you're going to also put yourself out of land. You don't manage your house, you'll lose it. You ever wonder why God gives wealthy people more wealth? Let me explain what I mean by that. Do you remember the three men who got the talents? The one who mismanaged it, who was that given to? The one who had the most. That doesn't make any sense, right? You think give the second one. No. Because the one who manages better or the best gets more. Hmm. I want you to think about this message today. Go back and check your life. There's a book out there called The Burden of Freedom. Please get that book. The book is about this, what I'm talking about. In that book, I wrote a lot of information on kingdom management. Because if you don't learn to manage right now, this crisis will destroy you. Wealth doesn't leave the planet. So when it's under pressure, it goes to the managers. And they should be kingdom people. Stop walking around claiming the wealth of the wicked. You don't get it by claiming it. We got this funny philosophy we have. You know, money cometh and, you know, call it in. What do you mean call it in? God never gave anyone who called it in. He gave it to those who were managers. Hard-working people who preserve his resources. God gave them more. You don't pray wealth into your hands. You manage it into your hands. Whatever you lost, you check it. You mismanaged it, that's all. God took it. Whatever you lost. What is management? Oh boy, it's a long definition, so please write it down. And those in business, write it twice. And if you've never taken a business course, write it three times. Please buy this CD and get the book on the burden of freedom. Management is what? It's the effective, efficient, correct, and timely use of another person's property. 
and resources for the purpose for which they delegated it to you with a view to producing the expected added value. That's management. It's a long definition, but every word is important. Management initially means you don't own the product. It's someone else's property. Management means you're not the owner. Right away, therefore, accountability becomes important. You and I are managers of earth. God gave us rulership, but never gave us ownership of planet earth. The earth is still the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but he watches how you manage it. And he shifts resources around based on your management, this mismanagement. I've seen marriages fall apart, not because people didn't love one another, they just didn't manage the marriage. You spend more time in church, more than you spend with your spouse, you just mismanagement. You spend more time speaking in tongues rather than kissing your wife. You need a good slap in your face. Oh, don't look at me like that. That's bad management. I don't want no prophecy. I want time with you. Don't prophesy to me. That's bad management. Yes, it is. We wonder why things fall apart. We got to repent, change our lives today, and say, Lord, please help me to manage. Your children don't want a pastor, they want a father. Yes, right. And my wife and I, we grew up, our kids are so wonderful. But you know, every week we made a plan. Every Thursday belongs to our kids, to my wife rather, every Saturday belongs to our kids. So we didn't plan nothing. On Mondays, that belongs to me. That's my private day. Thursday, I'm my wife's property. Anything she wants to do, anywhere she wants to go, that's our day. Saturday, our kids, they take us anywhere, they want to do whatever they want, talk, anything they want. In other words, we manage the time. Hallelujah. If somebody wants to see us and our kids wants to see us, no one sees us, our kids sees us. It's management. If you're dying and my wife needs to see me, you're going to have a funeral. What? I manage my life. I'm not married to you, I'm married to my wife. You know what's more important than my wife? If you're sick, you want to see me, you're going to die. Sounds tough, right? Let me read the Bible for you. Christ says, husbands, love your wife like I love my wife. He never said to love his wife. He said, love your wife. Oh, boy. Don't you ever love the church more than your wife. You don't read the Bible, that's all. Bad management. So what do you do? You repent, ask God to forgive you. And then God will put you back in the path and you start off fresh today. Management. Everybody say management. management. Other people's property. It's management. Is this good today? Yes. Y'all are quiet on me all of a sudden. Management is the primary goal of humanity. Whatever you fail to manage, you will lose. Say it loud. Whatever you fail to manage, you will lose. God's primary measure of trusting you is management. God will give to effective management. Why? Because management attracts resources. Say it loud. Management attracts resources. When you manage God's products, he gives you more. You know what I am right now? I'm a product of God. He sent me here from my country. And I am now in the front of you. You are using me, his product, to get his information. Now, how are you going to manage me is the question. You mismanage me, I don't come back. So you lose the teaching. It cost me to be here. I am worth $25,000 a day. Some of you put $2 in the, in the offering pan. That's mismanagement. I don't need to be here. Man, I'm not begging you, you know. I'm good, I'm debt free. What I'm saying is, if you mismanage the product, then the boss looks at that and says, you know something? I'm gonna send that product somewhere else because they mismanaged their product. Paul told the people in Philippi, he says, 
it is better for you that you give to me. Not that I needed a gift, but it goes to your account. It's management. Write this down. God will not give you what you ask for. Only what you can manage. So before you pray, check. Can I manage this? Lord, I need a, a husband. You better check first. Can I manage a man for the rest of my life? Lord, I need a wife. You better ask God carefully and slowly. That's a human you're asking for. Can you manage this, manage this relationship? That's why we get, we get books out there on men and women. Buy the books. It took me 30 years to write one of those books. You don't walk past the table. That's material for effective management of relationships. There's a book out there called The Purpose for Men. Every man should read it five times. Because most men don't even know what a man is. There's a book we have called The Purpose for Women. Read that book. Women are complicated. You've got to study them if you're going to manage them. Matter of fact, the Bible says, Husband, live with them according to knowledge, not according to the anointing, to knowledge. You need to know to manage a marriage. Go then invest in it. Our success as a marriage for 30 years is not magic, it's management. We have to manage our marriage. We have a great marriage. I love my wife. Ah, she's my baby. But let me tell you something. It took good management to have a good relationship. You ain't supposed to endure marriage. You're supposed to enjoy the relationship. But it comes from management. You got to manage this relationship. So you got to give to it. You got to cultivate. You got to listen. You got to serve. It's, it's management. Young ladies, a young man comes to say he want to marry you. First question you should ask him, can you manage this? Can you manage this? This is heavy stuff. I have a lot of needs. Can you manage my needs? Yeah. It's not simple as it looks. Can I get personal? It says. If anyone wants to be a leader in God's church, he must first manage his own home. Well, manage. That means you got other people's resources in that house. My wife don't belong to me. That's God's property. He told me to manage her. That's marriage taking someone else's property and making it better. Remember? Added value. It's a definition. You add value to the product. It be, it's supposed to be better because it came under your management. Sometime you marry somebody and after you're married, you are worse off than you were. They took away value. It's bad management. All right. Look at that word. What is manager? It's the age of man. It's the age where God wants you to handle his products. It's the age of man. All right. Let me close with these comments. God gave man dominion, management over earth. Man was given rulership but not ownership. Therefore, all humans are managers. He gave it to them. Let them have dominion. Everybody in this room is a manager. Hallelujah. And that means that in the kingdom of God, no man owns anything. Right. This is why God becomes a little bit excited when you start claiming things are yours. Are you all with me? I'm getting ready to go. 
You remember Christ told a story one time. He said there was a rich man who had much wealth. And he said to himself, now be careful when you're rich and start talking to yourself. He said to himself, my barns are full. My silos are brimming over. I have made myself rich. And Christ says, little did he know that that night his soul would be required of him. He was dead. When you start boasting on God's property, he takes it back. The best protection against losing God's resources is giving it away all the time. Just so God could know. See? I ain't keeping it. He watches that. That's why it's more blessed to give. Because it's a sign that you don't own. No man is an owner. The earth is still the Lord's. So you got a nice boat? Be careful. Use that boat to serve people. You got a nice house? You don't want no one coming in your house and put their feet on your rug. You better be careful. You're going to lose house, rug, and dog. God doesn't take lightly when you start claiming ownership. That's right. That's right. That's right. There are people in Florida right now who were doing fine until last month. And their big house has a sign in front now. Humility is a beautiful spirit. God raises up the humble, but he sets down the proud. This is mine. Careful. You're not an owner. And if you don't own, then I can tell you any time I feel like what to do with my resources. Give it to her now. Give it to him. See, I can tell you that. And you can't say, no, this is mine. It's my money. God says, wait a minute. That's right. You work for me. You don't own that. That's right. God will test your ownership by requiring you to give. That's all. Those folks that came up there last night, one of the gentlemen came to me. He said, I love him so much. He said, Pastor Miles, I had already, me and my wife already put $500 down. He said, but when you called, I just felt, God says, go again. Give a thousand bucks. I said to him, I says, you, you're going to live long. It's very hard for God to find people who are willing to give up his stuff. So he makes them live long. Stingy people are clogged up pipes. God gets rid of them. Amen. Write this down. Accountability is a natural result of management. And that's the issue. If you're going to make it through the crisis, God's going to check your accountability. What have you done with what I gave you the last two years? Can you give an account of what I gave you? Accountability. And so effective management determines the amount of your resources. It's not complicated. Effective management determines what? The amount of your resources. I have much more to say to you, but my time is gone. I promised to finish at 12.30. It is now 12.30. I will see you sometime in the future on the other side of the test. You will come through, won't you? Yes. Yes, and you're going to be standing on a rock, will you? Yes. And you're going to embarrass the crisis, right? Yes. You're going to laugh at tribulation. Am I right about that? Yes. Why? Because you are tougher than the wind. Because he who began a good work in you, he will finish it. 
That's right. And you will fly into the storm like an eagle and say, let me rest a while up here because this is where I belong. Give God a big hand today and a big hand for this week. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.